All set? Okay, everyone. Um, thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, my name is Luca Bontempo. I am a um, consultant here at Darwin Recruitment. Um, I would just like to let, welcome everyone to the sixth stop of our Data Science World Tour. Um, I do see a few familiar faces, talk to a few people um, in the lobby that I spoke to um, at our last data science event, which happened about two months ago here in Boston. Um, so for those people who are there, I appreciate you guys coming back for us round two. Um, for those who don't know, uh, Darwin Recruitment is a international digital data recruitment agency. We have locations in England, Holland, Germany, and Switzerland. Um, I do want to touch base upon our giveaway. So everyone's have a white slip of paper. Um, if you would like to fill out the necessary information, um, we are giving away once a so one winner based off of all the attendees from the seven stops of the world tour. Um, we'll win two tickets to Berlin to the Data Natives uh, Data Conference. Um, all for um, so yeah, sign up for it. You'll be put into a pool, and there's a very good chance when you guys could be the winners. Um, so I guess I do want to touch upon the speakers tonight. So speaking first, a gentleman named Dan Woolen. He is the Director of Data Science at Wayfair. He will be speaking about uh, deep learning and e-commerce, e uh, building a deep learning capability and driving strong results. We have a gentleman named uh, Brian uh, Ulicini. He is a Senior Director at Thompson Routers uh, Labs. He will be speaking on deep learning um, for legal artificial intelligence. Uh, finally, we have a gentleman named John Lin, um, Head of AI Project Delivery at Qlytics. He is speaking on artificial intelligence as a service, as well as some real-world use cases. So without further ado, I would like to present Dan Woolen. Um, so here, you, yeah. do we want to use the mic? I'll, I'll use this. this cool, yeah, sweet. It's all good. Awesome. Do I still need this? Yeah. Okay. All right, cool. Uh, first, thanks to everyone for taking the time today. I know time is incredibly precious, so really appreciate it. Um, the topic that I was going to cover was how at Wayfair we've built a deep learning capability over the last couple of years. Um, I'm going to get into a specific project, use that to illustrate some of the lessons that we picked up on the way. Uh, for the talk itself, I, I have it geared towards more of a high level um, around like the business strategy, some around the machine learning and data science. Uh, I'll be sure to leave time at the end so I can go into details on the, the modeling and, and those sorts of things if there are folks in the audience that are interested in it. Um, before I get in the talk, just brief background on me. Um, so, you know, I've been at Wayfair for around the last five years now, which, which is pretty incredible, and it puts me in the long tail of Wayfair uh, veterans. Prior to that, studied physics, uh, and then did consulting, and then joined Wayfair. That's my, my path in brief. And then as director of data science, I currently have uh, an 80-person team where it's largely PhDs, uh, some masters, some undergrads. We work um, mostly on the, the model building, algorithm building side uh, with some machine learning engineering. Uh, within that, I'll get into some more detail there, but that's really, really my background. Um, like I said, the talk itself, I'm structuring it around the lessons that we learned as we were building this deep learning capability. And you know, frankly, a lot of these are gonna sound cliche. I'll go into the details and, and make them come to life, but just going through it, you know, we initially went through a big challenge of just how do we get this off the ground? How do we build credibility for the business and, and get them excited about it, or as excited about it as we were at the time? Um, in terms of testing, everybody says test a lot. It's really important. I can walk you through some of the lessons we learned there uh, and how they helped us move faster. In terms of driving ROI, we've had a lot of success structuring our work, not just around one particular use case, um, but going after uh, building a platform so that different uh, product managers, different uh, engineers, data scientists within the organization can tap really flexibly into the work that we do. So I'll, I'll walk through that a bit. And then last but not least, how do you keep innovating? One of the traps of going through this whole process is you put so much time and effort getting something off the ground, it works well. Um, starting again can sometimes be a, a tricky proposition uh, if you're a little bit risk averse. So I can walk through some of the, the story there. Um, before that, though, I'll give some background on Wayfair, some about the data science team. This is one of my favorite slides because I, probably like up to three years ago, maybe two and a half years ago, I absolutely had to share it. I actually knew what Wayfair was. Nowadays, that's much less of a problem, but if I have it, I still, still do it. Um, from a business perspective, we're an e-commerce player. Uh, we're in home furnishings and decor, and, and that's pretty much it. And we're trying to help our customers find furniture that fits their, their aesthetic really well, so we have a really big catalog. Um, we're going after day, uh, good prices, really good customer experience, and so on. Um, the, the one thing that people 
do miss or you could miss if you're not paying close attention is we've been growing very, very rapidly. Um, so without getting into like all the bullet points, today we're roughly, uh, I think it's six and a half billion dollar run rate annual business with a clear path to be over $10 billion. So we're, we're you know, quite, quite large. Um, in terms of traditional retail, we have a really good logistics network, really good category, merchandising teams and so on. So from just a pure business perspective, it's been a really exciting journey, um, at least in my time at Wayfair. And from an engineering side, science side, which is where it gets you know, uh, interesting to me, is the company we have roughly 1,600 engineers, at least at the time of writing this. Uh, we build a lot of our technology in-house. Um, so there's very much a technical flavor behind everything we're doing. Yes, we're selling furniture, but frankly, in terms of the that my team is thinking through, we're thinking in terms of the math and the data and, 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 and the algorithm building. Um, from a data science perspective, you know, I already mentioned I have a team of around 80. Um, in aggregate, across Wayfair, we have roughly 120 data scientists across these different functions. Um, so I'll, I'll give you guys a quick walk through. The focus is gonna be on the computer vision side, um, but to give you a flavor of what we do outside of that, um, off the website, we do a ton around marketing. So you can think marketing measurement. We have a $600 million annual budget. We wanna make sure that we're getting the, the return that we can on that. Um, we do a lot around automated targeting, display retargeting, um, figuring out the creatives, and, and so on. Uh, on the sales and service side, you can think of this as connecting our customers with uh, specialists based on what they're shopping for. So imagine you're shopping the website, you want something renovation oriented, we're building the data science of figuring that out, stitching that together with your identity as a customer and, and making that connection. Um, merchandising, it, the, a good uh, analogy to draw here is if you think of Amazon or eBay, they put a ton of effort making sure that they have really great marketplaces. Um, so as Wayfair, we have to do pretty much the same thing. We're getting a lot of products, a lot of data from a variety of suppliers. Um, so what that means is we need to figure out how do we take images and text, unstructured text, use NLP, deep learning to generate meta tags, uh, and understand how do we curate that product within Wayfair's catalog. Um, and then when you think of on-site pricing, um, it's not within the scope of my team to be clear, but in terms of what we do, a lot of it is around um, modeling price elasticity, demand forecasting, so pretty traditional econ stuff. Um, personalization, think product recommendations, sales event recommendations, uh, we have a bit of reinforcement learning there as well. And then computer vision is, is where we're gonna do a deep dive uh, for today. So uh, when I say computer vision, to give you a bit of background as we get into the, the, the problem, um, within an, our vertical, images matter. So this is some sample data and, and this, isn't, this wasn't cherry picked. Like if you look at what people buy, um, and these are two products that one customer bought in close succession, they tend to be, there t tend to be stylistic similarities between them. Uh, so this one's pretty obvious. They're, they're kind of boxy, they're wooden, they're a similar price point. Um, so that's one, one data point. Um, the other is whenever we have something that's visually oriented, um, whether it's the catalog, whether it's you know, a particular experience on the website itself, people really love engage, engaging with it. So lots of data points show images matter. Makes a ton of sense, shouldn't be controversial. Um, and outside of data science, we've capitalized by optimizing our website towards this visual merchandising. Um, so I, I, as an example, I found the equivalent page on a computer website, you can probably guess who it is, um, and then I found the one on the Wayfair website, quite a bit different. Um, not to criticize this, I mean, there, there are pros and cons to both of them, but just illustrating the point that within our vertical, images matter. Um, and from a data science perspective, if you went back to 2016 at Wayfair, we were doing very traditional machine learning. We were not using images at all. Um, so it was a tremendous, frankly, gap, uh, a missed opportunity, and something that we really wanted to act on. Um, I'll breeze through this. I mean, this is just illustrating one of the UXs that we created. Um, nowadays, it's not that exceptional, but it's basically a, a visual search feature where on the app or the, frankly, you know, mobile or desktop, we let users either upload an image or take a photo, and then we find similar products in our catalog. Um, so part of the work that we did was building the underlying platform that, that powers this, as well as other things that we do on the website. All right. So, um, you know, what I said at the beginning was it was a little tricky to get buy-in for what we were doing. Because again, at the time, we were doing traditional machine learning. A lot of it was in marketing, some of the pricing. And from the business perspective, when we were trying to argue, no, no, like, you, sh you know, we need to build these, 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 these deep networks, they're gonna be able to do these really exciting things. The pushback was always, well, like, on the other hand, you can invest like one or two months, iterate on something that you're doing for search marketing or display marketing, 
and drive like X million dollars of lift, so why on earth would you do this risky, ill-defined thing? You know, pretty rational pushback um, from the business perspective. And uh, really the, the way that we got around it, and you know, I, I don't know your, your backgrounds, I imagine some of you are, are companies where um, you, you do hackathons. Um, frankly, if you don't, I think, think you should. You should sponsor them uh, yourselves. Um, and we've, this has been a tremendous mechanism for us to get the data scientists to, to experiment and build proof of concepts in a way that's not constrained um, as much by the actual business demand. So that it gives them an opportunity to be creative. And during one of these hackathons, we had roughly four engineers and data scientists build a proof of concept uh, for the original search with photo, um, both model as well as the full pipeline of letting the user take an image and then producing results out of our catalog. Um, Frankly, the, the initial results don't look so great. Um, so and this, this is literally some of the initial results. You know, user submits this. Uh, we give these four objects back. If you squint, maybe the ones on the end kind of you know, look similar. Um, and your initial reaction may be like, wow, this sucks. This, this was a, a big failure. But um, for us, the, it was actually a really good outcome because we were able to have something that people in the business could get their hands on um, and start playing around with. And, it, you know, answering the what if question of like, how would this look if we, if we invested a bit more in it? It was suddenly easier to answer because if all of a sudden you could start playing with it, you can, you can play those games. Well, you know, what if everything was kind of like this quality and, and so on? Um, so it turned out to be a really good um, thing to have done. Um, yeah, and, and we took it from there. Um, got a lot of confidence, um, had people fully allocated to the project. Um, and now I'm going to take a brief tangent to give you a little bit of background. Um, the first slide will be on deep learning in general. And again, I, I don't know everyone's full background, so I'm going to err on the side of being a little a bit higher level. Uh, and then the next slide will go a bit more into the model. Um, and again, as a caveat, I'll have time at the end to answer any detailed questions if you guys are curious. So in terms of the underlying model, how it works, let's assume you already have the model. Um, and the way that it works in practice when customers are interacting with the website is you take the product image, um, you pass it through the deep network, and it produces an image embedding or a vector. Um, but really the way to think about it, it's, it's taking this product or this image and putting it in a way where I can compare it apples to apples with other stuff in the catalog, where then distance between these things represents visual similarity. So that's kind of all there is to it once you have the model. You just need to create a pipeline where you can get this from here to here, and then do something like k-nearest neighbors or some kind of clustering algorithm if you want to find things that look similar to the inputted product. Um, but then, you know, the tricky question is how do you actually train a model to do that? Um, you know, running through it in, in our case, um, before getting at the model, you take pairs of images of either the, the same product or different products. Uh, Wayfair, we're fortunate because we have a ton of image data. Um, you know, frankly, from our suppliers, we're getting multiple images of the same product. Um, so it's, it's actually, you know, fantastic data for, for training this sort of model. Um, in the case of the first pass, uh, we used a Siamese network with contrastive loss. We played with, around with different loss functions, had some learnings there. Um, that, was, that was the first pass at it. And for those of you who aren't familiar with it, what that means is you're basically taking these pairs of, of images, um, plugging them into the model, and then you're rewarding the model um, in a way when uh, the embeddings end up close to each other, and you're sort of punishing it or modifying it like pretty, you know, intensely when, when, they're, when they're different from each other. Lots more details than that, but that's the way to think about it. And then as you go through this process and you, you train it, this is the only animation I have in the, the entire presentation. Um, as you train it, um, things which are similar or which you're labeling as similar get closer together. Things that aren't get further away. So that, that's conceptually at least how you create this image embedding space that lets you get at visual similarity. Okay, so we did the hackathon. Um, people were excited. We got investment. Uh, which was great. So from there, you know, the, the, the thing that became incredibly important, and again, I'm not saying anything groundbreaking, I hope to, to give you a little bit more of the detail for why it worked, uh, is we tested the living daylights out of it. Um, and, you know, at least for me philosophically, when I think about, you know, why test, why, why do iteration, there, there are two big reasons. One is, is, it's more from like a business perspective. You just want to get confidence that this thing will work, that people will care. Like there's a world where you roll out this feature and nobody engages with it and it's just useless. Um, the second reason why is, you know, frankly, there are all sorts of things that can go wrong. I hate quoting Donald Rumsfeld, but they're always unknown unknowns. And frankly, like running a test and seeing what breaks is an incredibly efficient way at getting at them, at least in e-commerce where you have a ton of data and you, you can do that relatively inexpensively. Um, so just walking through it a little bit, 
Um, in terms of the just getting establishing the business case, well, one, we, we took the really naive, kind of poor model and, and rolled it out. Um, and that was just to frankly get a sense of are people going to engage with this feature at all? We got a good amount of engagement. And then from there, whenever we went from you know, one version to the other, so this is showing um, repeat engagement, and I'm whiting out the, the KPI, sorry for that. Um, but think of this as like if somebody engages with the feature, what's their likelihood of coming back to the website within seven days? And um, this line is when we rolled out the, the second version of the model, so it's not a, the A-B test data, but it's just a pre-post look. Um, and you're seeing a really tangible uh, improvement in it. So what's great about this is, you know, imagine we, we have the model, we know customers are engaging with it. The question is, well, if I improve it theoretically, if I make the recall rate better, I, you know, do whatever, what, whatever it is, is it actually gonna matter? Um, this is great evidence that it matters. So the second one in terms of rooting out things that can go wrong, on one hand you could say, well, you know, I could just think about it. I can come up with long lists of like where the, the model can go wrong, where the pipeline could go wrong. Um, or you can just test it and see where it breaks and fix the big breaks and, and iterate from there. And just to give you a flavor of a recent example um, of this sort of thing, um, we recently paired object detection uh, with our visual search, meaning we, we let users take pictures of, of rooms, we're finding all the objects in them, they select one of the objects, the object goes into visual search, and that, that returns similar looking things. Um, frankly, what was happening, some users, they take what we call um, silos for silhouette, so it's just like a product on a white background. Uh, we also call them prison photos occasionally. Um, it's kind of a Wayfair joke, but I guess not that funny. And then um, it, people would take these, plug it into object detection, object detection just broke. And again, like th this is something where, yeah, for sure, you can, you can think in advance, or what are the edge, edge cases, we do a ton of that. Um, inevitably, you're gonna miss some, so why not just roll out the feature for a few hours and get a sense of where it breaks and then fix from there. So, you know, kind of a minor example. Um, but something that was incredibly um, valuable for us. So, you know, from there, part of the story then becomes, well, we have this feature and, you know, a lot of our customers engage with it, not, not a majority, to, to be honest. So it's, so it's useful, but there, there's a ceiling to how many people are actually gonna go to the search bar and search for similar looking things based on whatever image they have. Um, so how do I ensure confidently that we're actually getting real value out of this thing? And you know, really the lesson that we learned was treating it as a platform. So rather than creating something which is just for this isolated use case, putting some thought behind how do we make this visual similarity engine, whether it's the embeddings, whether it's the model itself, available to data scientists, uh, different product managers in Wayfair, so they'd be able to plug into it in a relatively inexpensive way, you know, not, not meaning they don't you know, need additional development and, and so on, uh, and then just try it out on lots of different things. Um, so we took that approach, and I have some data here. Um, the way to think about it, so this is uh, weekly averages uh, for every quarter, going back to the end of 2017, and it's showing the number of interactions with our visual search platform, so you can think every time we, we ping it with a request to give me similar looking objects, um, an interaction, that's considered one interaction. Um, and we basically had, you know, over a 10x increase, I mean, it was a projection at this point, but in re it, this is reality now because we're, we're in Q3 2018, or Q4. Um, we've had a 10x increase in that. So starting from that search with photo, we're using in all sorts of different stuff. The different stacks of the bar represent those different things. I'm not sharing what they, specifically I'll give you some, some examples in a slide. Um, but again, this, this, this is how we've been able to scale up the work of a relatively small team of data scientists and, and have it impact and, and really just like flourish um, within Wayfair. The examples come next. Um, so the, the, the point of this slide, so now, now we have a model, it's plugging into all these different use cases. Um, that's, that's one thing that amplifies how much return you're getting on it. The other is when I make improvements to the model, those improvements pass to all these different use cases. So it's, it's this really like multiplicative effect. Um, so what I'm showing here is something called recall at one. We evaluate our models all sorts of different ways. Um, for those of you who, who haven't done this sort of thing before, um, at least the way we're defining recall at one, it's a notion of if I take a, a photo of a known product and I submit it to visual search, what percentage of the time do I get that product back at the top of the list? Sounds like it should be a pretty easy task. It's actually pretty hard for us because we have such a, a deep catalog and there's frankly lots of similar looking things even if they're not quite the same. Um, but the, the point here is we, we started with a baseline effectively off the shelf model um, down here 
um, and you know, over time we've been able to see pretty substantial improvements. So um, these, these jumps related to underlying model improvements. Um, this one we were uh, originally, I think, applying the, the, the model to call it like 50% of our catalog and then we expanded the scope so then the model performance can suffer a little bit but we were able to, to maintain it. But really the point here, we got 4x improvement over time. It's flowing to all these different use cases. So in terms of the use cases, because I've been fairly vague about them, um, one example, and it's, it's really simple, but it, but it matters, uh, is for out-of-stock photos uh, or out-of-stock products. Um, the, what was happening, customers would add something to their car or they would browse it and then um, go back to the website and the product's not there anymore. Um, just bad experience. So it's really like all we did was we created a product carousel or, or our product team created a product carousel um, that was using this as input into visual search and then generating similar looking products. Extremely simple. Um, we saw like a mid single digit increase rate, uh, increase in conversion and like a pretty substantial decline in bounce rate. Um, and probably took like a, you know, a day or two of engineering time. So re really great, great adaptation. Um, I already mentioned how we mix search with photo with object detection. This is just a visual of it where this would be, you know, the example image submitted by the customer. Our object detection algorithm is finding the different products in it and then they can click into the product and then look at similar looking things there. Uh, the, other, the other case where we've been able to apply it Frankly, this is one that gets me a lot more excited because it's data science, is we're using these embeddings throughout the data science team. Um, so one area where, where it's been really fruitful for us, and this ties back to that original example um, around people shop for similar looking things, um, is we've been able to use it to power product recommendations. And just the idea of like, if I'm shopping for this and I wanna find something that goes with it, it's really hard for a customer to articulate that. Because uh, I bet if I asked you guys like, what style is this? You know, or like what are the, what material, I mean, this is wood in this case, but in some cases if I asked you what material, you know, it would be, it would be non-trivial to answer it. Um, so what we did was we created a, uh, an algorithm that uses the image embeddings as a feature, um, and then we're able to match products across different types of product uh, in a way that captures style. Um, so this is actual output, TV stand, and then we would recommend the, the bookcase. Uh, testing myself here, I think that's a nightstand, and. Maybe this was a TV stand that was a coffee table, but, but you get the picture. Where a customer, in, you know, they're, they're browsing in one class and then seamlessly we're able to show them things that look stylistically similar without them even asking. So really powerful sort of experience. Um, very happy to talk about that algorithm as well. The other thing we do, which is really cool and, and kind of sneaky, uh, it's not really sneaky, I mean, everybody does it, is we, um, you can scrape data off of competitor websites. We scrape data off of competitor websites. and um, what we try to do with it, or one of the things we try to do with it, is match the, the, the products in our catalog to competitor products, and then you get a notion of what are other people charging for these things, and you know, do we have a gap in our assortment compared to other people? And um, I, I was trying to be very benign, so I picked a, an example from Germany. Um, so it's Home24, big home furnishings competitor, Wayfair um, sells stuff in Germany. We were doing, doing pretty well there. Um, and it's kind of a trivial example. I mean, in this case, it's clearly the same product, a little, you know, a little bit different of an angle. Um, but what's special here is Home24 is masking the supplier using just different text. And if we hadn't used the image to make the match, we wouldn't have been able to make it at all. Um, so with, within merchandising, we're using a combination of uh, text embeddings and image embeddings to power a, a product similarity uh, approach. All right, last but not least, um, so like I said at the very beginning, it's incredibly easy to fall into a trap of, well, I took a risk, it paid off, I know how to iterate on this thing, so I'm just gonna keep on iterating on it because then people just keep on patting me on the shoulder and, and, and so on. Um, you can't do that, you're gonna, miss, you're gonna miss out on big opportunities. Ideally, you get to do a mix of both of them and that, that's what we aspire to do, but um, you don't wanna run into it. And you know, the, the example of you know, what we would have missed if we didn't keep trying to innovate is um, think of how customers shop. One mode is I know like a chair or um, you know, uh, a table or whatever it is and I want something that looks similar to it. The other mode is I have a room of stuff and I want something that goes well with it. So it's a notion of complementarity. It's, it's not, not around similarity. So you don't necessarily want something that's the same color. You want something that kind of fits well with it. Um, that was a huge opportunity. It's obvious in the computer vision slash deep learning space. Um, so that's, that's where we're, what we're working on actively now. 
Um, so I'll walk you through um, some of the work that we're doing. Um, so that was a high-level project, or, or what we've been going after, is how do we understand visual complementarity from a proof of concept? So how do we get it off the ground? How do we get people confident in it? We're not trying to solve the whole thing where we go from a room to a set of product recommendations. We're trying to solve just given a room, what are other rooms that look like it? So at least getting at this sort of like holistic sense of taking this like what, um, how, do I, how do I articulate its style? Or at least how do I have a machine articulate its style? Um, so from a schematic perspective, um, we, we have a couple layers. So one, you know, we get images like this. We're figuring out what sort of room uh, it is. And from there, um, we're breaking it down into uh, basically a style distribution. Um, and we're training this off of how uh, designers actually articulate style. So it's pretty cool. So like if, if you were to talk to like an actual room designer, they would, they would, they do have a sense of this is like 50% Scandinavian, 25%. I don't actually know styles because I'm on the data science team. You get the picture. It's a distribution of things. That's how we're building it. Um, and then I have some early output. Uh, so this is a modern image. Um, this is the sort of results you get. And actually very similar to the computer vision case, like you kind of have to squint to see that it works. But frankly, it's, it's, it's not bad. It's, it's getting at a sense of um, it's relatively you know, sparsely decorated. It's pretty angular. It tends to be pretty light. Um, in the case of the rustic example, it you know, totally picks up on, on the fact that it's, it's wooden. And um, you can sort of piece things together. Um, but it's actual output. It's something that we're able to test in different areas of the user experience already. So we're going down that path of, like, by adding these things, are, are we getting meaningful, um, meaningful customer engagement? So that's everything I got. Um, I took about 25 minutes, so I think I have five-ish minutes left, or basically as much um, to cover any questions that you have. Um, you know, in, I should say, like, feel free to connect with me, email me. I'm totally happy to engage. We're hiring a lot at Wayfair, so um, if you haven't spoken to us and might be interested, like, please, please reach out. Yes. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So, so it's so it's it's not no no yeah. So um, uh, generally no. In our our case, um, just because of how we're training it and some of the parameters, we end up getting different classes of products that cluster in the space. So in theory, we could come up with a representation where like the first couple of dimensions capture bar stools, the next cap capture cat trees, but um, any nuance beyond that, we're not. The, the, the reason we get that feature is because we're, we're explicitly forcing the classes to sort of sit up, the classes of product to go away from each other. Okay. Yeah, that, that that that's correct. So so basically, basically we're we're taking like we're you know you're iterate you take you um, go through your data set, um, we're placing the product in the space, and then we we use um, we have a margin. So basically a margin of error that that you allow for where um, if they're different products and they're sufficiently far apart, like good enough, like I don't have to worry about it. If they're like within that margin, you do care about that. You tweak the model um, based off of that, and and um, yeah, there are like some other bits and pieces, but that that's the general idea. Yeah, I mean, there, 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 there are a few things. So I, I would say the hackathons are things like the hackathon. A lot of it is, you know, either there might be folks on the team where they have an idea, and whether it's me or their manager, um, you know, it's like, okay, great, you know, take take a few hours here and there and see what you can do with it. Um, and if you, you know passes the bar of getting me convinced, then you know we'll bring it to um, other folks within Wayfair and, and get them on board with it. So it's a similar sort of flavor of the hackathon. Um, you know, frankly, uh, going to conferences, which is something we haven't done much of historically, we started doing a lot more of it probably starting six, eight months ago. Like, I think of that as March Madness for nerds. It just gets people really excited. It's, you know, great networking opportunity. Um, and just, that, that's been a very fruitful way to get people thinking creatively. Um, but frankly, it, it just, it, it all boils down to, like, having people sincere, like, sincerely have that, that belief and that, that awareness that if they come up with something, that, that's exciting, that, that people will, will get behind it. So there, there is that sort of team culture component. Yep. Oh, I, th I think you had a question? Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about, um, and I'm not sure if this actually is an issue or not. But Probably. We, we have a lot of issues. Uh-huh. 
Oh, sure. So, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so we, we, we don't. Like, we, um, for pretty much like all these, these projects, we have um, data from different sources, but like so much of it relies on having a, a, a sufficiently large amount of that label data. Um, so indeed, there, there are a lot of class, or some classes on our website today that they're not really covered by the, the model itself. So I think, I can't tell you the exact number. We cover the vast majority of, of them, but, but they're kind of like forks or something. Like we just don't, don't have enough. Um, but that, that's a case where you could probably use traditional computer vision techniques to, to, to get something going. But yeah, in some cases, we're, we're just, we can't do it. Yeah, do, do you mean with like non-technical folks or like within the team? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so um, for, for sure the push is at, at minimum to have an intuitive understanding of what's going on. In the case of deep learning models, like my expectation there is there's gonna be some like vague sense of, well, this is what the architecture does because of blah, blah, blah. Um, I have physics training, so it's never really that satisfying to me personally, but it is what it is. Um, I, there should be a very clear um, explanation of the sorts of training data, how it was structured, how it was sampled from, and so on, and how that's influencing the output of the model. Um, so yeah, a mix of intuition um, in terms of like the training data and, and whatever features are going to model, I, the, the bar goes up. Um, and then the more traditional, the closer you get to tr traditional machine learning, the higher the bar goes for, for how well you should be able to understand um, what's, what's going on under the hood. But I, I, I do my best to, and the team does, the, does its best to be pragmatic. It's of the order of hundreds. Yep. Um, yeah, we, we've thought all. Yeah, they're, they're, yeah, yeah. It's of the, of the order of hundreds. There, there are a lot of like interesting things around that where um, you can worry about it just from like a pure theoretical sense of if I have this model offline, like what, what's the, the optimum way to do it? Um, you run into questions around like in production, like what what does it mean to have like x many dimensions available in real time? So there there are interesting trade offs we we have to make. One more? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, are you working on a recent job uh, in like a deep search question? So, when you do deep search, when somebody has just taken the Aruba search and gone, and so say I took out the key of my room, and then I want to search if a function is affected, what kind of cloud search question is it? Yeah, so, okay. There, there, there are a few angles to go after that. Um, I guess, like, one, um, and this is like, It'll take us a while to, to get there. Um, there. There are techniques around 3D reconstruction um, where you can take a panoramic video, um, or not a panoramic um, image, uh, and then you, you get back uh, a rough 3D, like roughly low resolution, but, but good enough model of that room. Wayfair has, we have thousands of, and they're open source, um, CAD models of the different stuff that we sell. So as soon as you have the 3D model, you have to ask a user for a little bit of input for like what the scale of, of, of things happen to be in it. Um, you can start placing stuff into it. So I'm not, not quite answering your question because there's so many different ways to go after it, but um, that's at least like one thing in that direction that, that we've thought about. And then there, there's some, um, uh, some folks are using GANs to play around with like how do you go, how do you like fit things into a, like a, a, a more of like a, a room sort of setup. Yeah, we don't always. So, so we, we, have a, we have basically tiers of, of data, um, like, you know, like anyone else, but um, it runs the gamut of data which is carefully labeled by room designers, like in-house, that's super high quality. Um, we have our own, ver like a really an in internal version of Mechanical Turk. Um, that, that's pretty good quality because we're, you know, controlling the, the training of those folks, um, the interfaces that they're using to input it, so we have a lot of, a lot of control there. Uh, and then we'll scrape data, that's kind of, and then we have user-generated content. For images, 
it, it's primarily the photos that we get from suppliers because for any given product, we're gonna get multiple photos of it from different angles and in different settings, so it's actually extremely useful. Um, we, we are careful about also considering user-generated content because, yeah, the, those photos tend to be lower quality, so we, we gotta, gotta work those in there so that we get, so what we're doing is uh, generalizable. All right, oh, very, maybe very last one, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, so so it's a good question. Um, it's going under the hood a bit. Like uh, we have a, a variety of recommendation algorithms, and so you can think of ones that are content-based, where it'll get right at you know the material, price point, things of that nature. We have ones which are just click-based, so lots of people click this thing, tend to click that, um, and then in in so in some cases we'll have folks like or product managers basically say for this carousel or in this part of the website. Like my hypothesis is that this sort of recommendation will work well. So the out of stock is a great example where somebody could just jump to it and say, "Hey, let, let me try the visual similarity uh, approach." So we have a, a suite of things that that we can test, um, and then we also have uh, for the, for those of you who are like familiar with um, recommendation models, we also have a uh, it's similar to to the approach that YouTube has taken, where there's something we can layer on top of that, where we can get candidates from all these different strategies. So imagine like the customer's browsing. We don't know if we should go after style. We should go after things at the same price point. You can collect a big pool of these and then apply sort of a meta model to, to do a ranking of those. So you know, frankly, we have a lot, lots of different ways to, to go after it based on the, the user context. All right, thanks everyone. Yeah, of course. Cool, gotcha, go ahead. Thank you, Dan, appreciate it. Um, so unfortunately, uh, everyone, Brian, which is our last speaker, dropped out for reasons out of our control, so he won't be able to be here. So we have a gentleman named Jamie, who um, is with CIC, that would like to say a few words. Thanks. Hey, everyone, I, I just wanted to introduce myself. science, AI, those sorts of things. We do hackathons. Um, so, if you have any questions about what CIC does, I'm going to be right out in the cafe at the end of this. Um, please come say hi. If you have questions about what all of these cool machines that are blinking at you are about, um, also you can come uh, ask me about that. That's our, our fab lab here in this space in particular. Um, and I'm going to also, I'm going to write my colleague's email address on the wall here. Um, this is my colleague Solomon Flax and he is the coordinator for this event. And if you are interested in our events program or uh, have any questions about, if you have an idea for an event that you think would be a really good fit here, he would be happy to answer all of those. Um, so thanks for your time. No, if you're ready, we'll take you right now. Do this transfer with you real quick. Do I still need a holding? No, I don't need to. If I have this one, you ready? I don't think so. This one okay. should take care of it. Okay. So we have John Lynn. John is the head of AI product delivery at Qubit. Um, he's going to be speaking on AI as a service and some real world use cases. Take it away, John. Okay. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Let's see. 
Oh. Can you hear me? No? Happy to uh, see everybody here. And uh, let me ask you guys a question uh, uh, in lieu of dance speech, uh, dance presentation. How many of you working in a company has a uh, hundred and plus, hundred plus data scientists? Probably not. <laughs> I don't see anybody, right? So Wayfair is a big, big company. They have a <coughs> hundred plus data scientists, and they have another three or four hundred. Uh, a uh, engineer or software engineer, so it's a big one. Of course, we have you know Google. And these are thousands, tens of thousands of data centers. But majority of companies in the whole world, in the U.S. at least, and other parts of the world, they don't have people. And like your companies, maybe small or medium-sized companies, only a few people, small team, or maybe a dozen people, right? So, so I want to give you a, a little business perspective what's out in the world, especially actually from Asia, from China, just back uh, from a business trip uh, a few days ago um, for, the, for my company, um, <clears throat> try to expand into the China market. And uh, so it's all pretty much eye-opening to see how they apply data science and, uh, and machine learning. Um, so give you a sense of uh, the need is huge. Um, you know, the business definitely need more of you, a <laughs> hundred times of you. And uh, also give you a perspective of uh, um, AI as a service, as an agile, um, a sort of plugging like a Lego pieces put together. You can do things without waiting to invest 10 millions of dollars for 100 scientists. So, so uh, a, a brief background of, uh, of me. Uh, been doing data, anything about data or analytics for 20 plus years. I started as a SAS programmer, statistical programmer, um, doing healthcare data, medical data. Back then, we don't call data scientists and no cool names, just uh, as programmers, statistical programmer, SAS program. And still very hard right now uh, <coughs> in the medical field, but now it's becoming hard. And then I move on to uh, doing a lot of project management and uh, team management and doing a lot of uh, management consulting in the data space about data strategy, data governance, and now AI and, and machine learning is so hard, so I have to talk and <laughs> do AI and machine learning projects, which is exciting. So it's a, uh, just a quick uh, intro. So this is a little cut off, but uh, um, it just give you a highlight of uh, um, basically, this uh, says <clears throat> the future will belong, will belong to those who quickly AI enable their business. Um, um, excuse me, I have a cold actually <clears throat> this couple of days uh, to extract the insights. So basically, AI enable your business, basically embedding AI in every part of your business to try to automate and try to make it more efficient. That's, that's the summary of this. And I already mentioned that there's a lot of uh, big companies hiring hundreds of thousands of data scientists and the, the, the price tag of you know hiring a data scientist is 150 average probably 200 in some cases even half a million and in salary if you are a very senior computer vision um, I, I think the, the most recent report I heard I think from Stanford University uh, they they graduate uh, computer science that um, whole is very good in computer vision every year, only just a handful of them. So, uh, so especially the computer vision, it's very hot now, and uh, the top of the tier is really high salary, but not everybody can afford it. Um, um, but so my presentation is talk about practical, practically whatever the company size, how can you include, uh, uh, increase productivity? And also, can we find, uh, build an agile platform can deliver AI services? Um, so that's 
So that's that, and uh, using an agile talent pool. Um, and this is the, now uh, this is a, a, a quick Western view of the application of uh, AI services. So mostly you will see here will be on sales and uh, marketing, uh, lead scoring. That's what Dan's presentation about the Wayfair is a consumer product. It's about how you attract the consumers or how you uh, increase sales and uh, uh, introducing, you know, recommending different products. Mostly about that, but there's other industry, other places really need help as well. So it just sort of like enlarge your uh, a, a vision of what's out there. Not just say, hey, I, I can only do this industry. I can only do this, That's what I know. No, it, it's applicable to pretty, pretty much every sector. So this gives you a, 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 a view from the Asia side, especially from a trip, so a few cases. Uh, unfortunately, there's some pictures uh, cut off. Uh, so this is one case of China State Grid. It's like a national grid here in the United States, in Boston area, right? So it's a power, power company, uh, generation company. They have one billion consumers, one billion literally. When, when I met with their CIO, I say, you know, how many consumers? He has one billion individual consumers, the data in his hand. <laughs> so it's like a crazy, you have so much data, right? And uh, at least a different uh, 20 plus, a lot of characteristics, you know, a call volume, the complaining or things, a power outage or whatever. And the, the call center definitely has a lot of challenges. They have a lot of people, but they try to uh, employ AI. Uh, mostly in the chatbot, uh, sort of try to be uh, automatic. You know, you call, you, you hear voice say, hey, outage, you know, where? So um, the, the challenge is here is they, they do have a small team, but the challenge here is after seven rounds of calls, I call today, then I hang up, and then uh, this afternoon I call again, then tomorrow I call again. After seven times, they, their algorithm has some problem. I'm trying to travel, can, cannot accurately you know, respond to um, the, the, the problem. So, so what do we provide? I will later uh, give you a quick introduction of my company, what, what the company is doing, is, is we, can, we can find those high level um, you know, you know, machine learning engineer to solve these complex algorithm problems. I myself, I, don't, I cannot do it, but uh, we have a talent pool, we can do that. So that's just give you one example. And the other example, uh, Chinese airline, there's one airline they want to uh, boarding by, you know, uh, uh, you know, scanning your face. It's probably more common if you go out of the border, US and coming back, your fingerprint and the, you know, facial. And even the, uh, the hotel, the very little tiny hotel, I stay there, uh, they have, they, they, they just check in my facial recognition. I was like, oh, wow, you know, why are you doing that? You don't need to do that. But, you know, look at my passport is enough. But they're doing that. So you, you, you can imagine uh, that uh, in a lot of areas, uh, the China is like probably a few years ahead of the U.S. So they, they want to take in passengers, you know, facial recognition and boarding by that, not boarding pass, paper pass, paper boarding pass. And the other one is uh, they want to track in you because a lot of passengers, folks, are wandering around in the airport and getting lost, or, or taking too much time, they forgot their, uh, you know, departure time, and, and you know, the flight will gonna be late. Especially over there, there's a lot of delays, and uh, even for one passenger, maybe a VIP or whoever, then the delay is three hours. You know, it's uh, basically intolerable. So they try to, you know, give you a, a, a tracking mechanism to that. So that's kind of a problem they they're facing. Here and uh, then, uh, then another problem uh, in, in uh, is sort of a government agency archiving. They have tens of hundreds of millions of uh, uh, files uh, dated a hundred years ago. Um, There's an image again. I really want to show you the page. The image is sort of a stamp. Every document, every file, they have. Um, a classification sort of stamp, like uh, this is the top secret, the second level, third level, it's a Chinese character, it's like a picture. Uh, um, and they want us, they, 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 every month they have hundreds of people coming here, look at a screen and try, <laughs> try to, you know, sorting these things, which is really not necessary. So 
and basically you, you can use OCR in you know, object character uh, system or you can use a natural language or even computer vision you know or a combination of it can solve that problem so that's another use case you know how can you automate that process uh, maybe this is the last one I'm not sure the last case oh the shipping containers uh, there's some image they also cut it off is uh, under, under containers you have some uh, um, uh, scanners and some uh, sort of like a barcode on a container they try to you know uh, matching you know what kind of type of uh, commodities uh, are on the shipping container so uh, they they achieve 90 percent accuracy with their own people scientists doing sort of statistical modeling um, but they want to achieve high 95 or 98 percent so then you need uh, some you know machine learning on that. In the last two cases here, one is the education, right? In China, is the college admission entrance test is like uh, uh, everybody have to take that, and uh, really, uh, you know, a million people just want to get into the top college every year. It's pretty much uh, it's a, it's a it's a crazy uh, thing, um, and uh, they have a lot a lot of problems as well. You know, some people. Have uh, somebody taking the exam for you, <laughs> or do some cheating stuff. So, and they have a lot of video, video recording, monitoring. You know, you can imagine every, not every street corner, but pretty much the traffic, everything. A lot of storefront. You know, a lot of videotapes, and uh, and uh, more than here, right? Here we concern about privacy. We concern about you know your rights and you know all these things. But over there, that's. That's good or bad, right? Good is you can catch the bad guys, <laughs> and uh, and the and the bad is also probably you catch the bad guys in the in the in the country over there. <laughs> um, so again, uh, there's a lot of needs there. They want to automate that. You know, they have people you know scanning the uh, video recordings of the exam. That's too late, right? Things happened and whatever. So, and they ask us for help. Then can you help there with? You know, we say yes. <laughs> so that's a, uh, and the last last case is a uh, solar power um, or wind power plant. Um, like here, you you have solar power panel and generating power on a monthly basis. But but if if the, the if the weather changes, it's not a lot of sun. Then you have to use the traditional, you know, maybe nuclear, maybe coal firing power generating those power to compensate the lack of the, uh, the solar and the, um, and the wind power. So, so they have a model, try to, um, there's, a, uh, there's a model try to predict right, the next 30 days, the next three days, uh, you know, what's the weather and how much uh, electricity I want to generate uh, in lieu of lack of solar or wind power. How you do that? So they, they again, people attempted those a uh, long time ago, and they did some accuracy over there achieved, but they want a higher accuracy. They want to every 15 minutes or 10 minutes have have a prediction um, of the weather and then prediction of the power generated generation needed um, to compensate or whatever the lack of the solar and the wind power. So, so they say. Hey, can you do that? I mean, in terms of machine learning, um, you know, they do their own modeling very manual. They, you know, one, you know, factors of let's say ten factors of wind and uh, the temperature or, or, or anything else, and they put it there uh, one at a time. As you, some of you know, statistics that you have to do a regression test. You put a one factor, the second factor, and then see how that goes. Sort of a little manual, and uh, they want to automate that. You want to automate that, and the machine learning basically is uh, look like the, sort of like a cluster. You put in, the, and uh, you you don't have to, uh, especially neural network. You don't have to tell, uh, you know, wh which factor is you know in the order of the, the doing that kind of modeling. You just put in there, and it will generate uh, some interesting relationship and network um, a model out of that. So this is the last. Um, no, this is good. I have a picture here. This is like the exam room, college entrance exam room, and uh, people watching the video, recording on a real time, try to try to uh, catch the cheater or things like that. 
Um, so that's all the cases here. And uh, this slide is about how we can, uh, in a real business world, how we can deliver those solutions. I talk about cases. I don't talk about a lot of, lot of algorithm. I just generally say, okay, we have, we have a tech, tech, technology to do that, or whether they call it computer vision or NLP, whatever, right? So how can we really do it? Couple of consideration is, Everybody, uh, nowadays we have AWS, Azure, um, and Google Cloud in the US, but in China there's a equivalent to Tencent or Alibaba, Ali Cloud, and they have other private cloud, and they have on-premise uh, servers as well. So how can you build a system you, you, you don't have to stick to a spe specific, you know, um, platform, cloud platform? Uh, um, that, that's, that's the one that we have to solve. And the next one is, uh, you know, once you deliver a solution, a project, all these are projects, all these cases, we say, hey, we can do it. Okay, we can use our resources, our people, solve your problem. Maybe it's a six months project or three months project. At the end of the project, it could become a product. This thing, we solve this problem, we can productize this thing, and we can resell to similar <laughs> Companies, if it, and it's a bank, then we sell to another bank. <laughs> airline, we can sell to another airline. So, and we can improve on that. Our people can improve on that. Engineer can improve on that. And then how you deliver these upgrades? So they are interested in that. They say, okay, you solve my problem, short-term pain, but I'm gonna have more problems down the road. I have more needs. If you have new feature, how you deliver that remotely, securely, and uh, platform agnostic or customized, like, you know, whatever. So how can you deliver that and all these up upgrade? Um, the way we do it is, is sort of a remote. Um, the last point is API. We have API plugin. We can say, okay, yeah, you know, we can deliver that to you um, in, in a secure environment. So um, give you a little quick intro of the company, how, how we're doing that. Uh, it, it, the name is a little funny. It's called it's a little awkward, but it's a Cambridge-based uh, company we have in office in New York. And basically, the only keyword uh, to take away from my presentation is AI as a service, meaning you don't need ha you don't need a hundred data scientists. If you don't have, that's fine. You, what, what you need is you you have a this problem, and you want to solve this problem, and you have some investment to solve this problem. Then you can talk to us, and we can. We can achieve that. So how can we achieve that is we build a platform, we call Q platform, we have some key components. The first one is the most important, the talent hub, as I said, because not everybody has 100 data plus scientists. Not everybody is Google. Most of the business, they don't have those people. And in maybe the next 10 years, we still not enough have these people. So our model is sort of a freelancing model. Around 2,700 globally, uh, AI machine learning engineer. It could be you, could be other folks. You may have your full-time job, you may have your part-time job. Doesn't matter, but it's a project base. So we certify those people through network, through different means. We collect them and we we you know, sort of uh, ranking them and certify them. And so we know, let's say, computer vision, we have 50 of them, and we know five or 10 of them at the top of the so if we really need those people to solve the most complex part, we can do that. So that's why this is the most important for you is the most important in all these puzzles. Um, and it's a spread out in the, in the, in the uh, globally. A um, lot of in Asia, a lot of in the US. So that's the talent hub we have. And the second thing, we, we, we take all the most popular tools, you know, text analyzer or whatever, these 20 or 30 or we collect them, we put them, you know, and put on the, uh, um, the platform. So you go in there, the engineer going there, they can take, you know, like uh, Legos, you can, you can take that quickly. Of course, you know, you, you, if you want to customize, you have to do, you know, a little, you know, coding adjustment. But these are the popular things, it's in, all in one. That's the beauty of it. You don't have to, you know, search for other things because those are the most, most commonly used tech you know, uh, uh, tools and algorithms. 
And then with security, we, we make sure it's all secure. Because China, they are all about security. They say, hey, I don't want to. <laughs> I don't want a US tech, I want a US technology, but I don't want, want the AWS. I want a Tencent or something. We say, okay, uh, we can deliver on you, you know, uh, deliver to you, uh, to your Tencent cloud environment. And we can do that. So, you know, we make sure it's secure. We don't need to see your data. Uh, and, uh, and we also protect the IP. You know, you, the IP, you cannot take our IP. And also, we have a lot of open data sources we collect together and, and um, yeah, stored in the, in the platform. It's thousands of, you know, like 350,000. They say if it's a financial report, we have last 20 years of uh, 10K or whatever. So you, in terms of training, um, you ask about you know, training model, what kind of data is good. The data is evolving, data is uh, increasing. You know, so it's like a big lake. <laughs> So you have to, uh, so we have those and, and we can take whatever we need to train your model. That's the third piece. And the last piece is project management. Um, it, it's, built, it's a built team, so we can say, okay, uh, these two people working for us on this project for three months, and we take screenshots of how you're doing uh, if you are working for us, and we say, okay, we know, and we pay you by hour. You know, you know, you know how, how many hours you did, and we pay you fairly, uh, handsomely, I would say, for the project. So we, we everything in the platform, you can log in, anybody, the client can log in, or we can log in, and uh, our people engineer from around the globe can log in, do the project. And when we do the, deliver the project, and we, we, we um, you know, we can in, install on your system, and, um, and, and then upgrade the system securely. So. So that's the last piece. Um, so it's a bit of summary is in terms of AI, you really have to look at the business side of it. You know, what's the pain points, what, um, what they want to, what kind of problem they want to solve. Um, I don't think we have time for the demo, but uh, I will welcome you to uh, check our website. Um, so, uh, this is sort of the summaries, uh, you know, human brain plus AI equal to human dream job. So uh, it's really uh, very, very optimistic. I'm very optimistic is that the needs is really very, very high. Uh, once I, you know, this is my first time doing the, the uh, AI business trip over China. I was like, uh, well, it's, it's everywhere. <laughs> it's everybody talk about it. And everybody want a piece of it, and uh, and this is great. Boston is uh, is a huge hub. So feel free to contact me and uh, uh, LinkedIn, and also check our website. It's just curious.com. There's a platform there, and you can uh, you know t as a test, as a user, you can uh, you know try a few things and uh, see how that works. Thank you very much. Any questions? Few minutes. Yes. Can you say it again? Sorry. You said in China, like, people didn't yeah. give the exam. Like, in oh. The exam. So how do you solve that problem? Okay. Yeah, the, the exam problem is a project. We're still working on that. <laughs> so um, so basically, they have the videotapes, right? So we, we're going to collect all these videotapes and, uh, and um, um, use the computer vision, you know, and, and uh, detect, detect uh, uh, using their historical videotapes and, and build a model, build an algorithm, and then we, you know, and apply them. And they want it real time, but I think the first step will we have to look look at the historical data. You know, may, maybe the last two years they uh, the apply thing and and try to figure out, you know, is that the cheater, or you know, you 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 passing the pencil, or you talking to the next door, next next people, so. So it's a, it's, a, it's a live project we are working on. So I don't have a specific you know, algorithm to tell you, say, hey, use that one, use that one. But, but uh, you know, we are positive we can, we can do that. Yeah, I mean, in terms of algorithm, I, I, because it's a working project, so I, I don't have a specific algorithm. But uh, it, it's, uh, 
one way to look at this is uh, we're going to have some uh, human beings to look at uh, the labeling things. You say, okay, look at this, that's a cheater. But we need to, you know, you know, to come back like, a, you know, two categories, this or that, and maybe the last one. And no, we're not so sure. So initially, labeling will be huge. Uh, uh, it's human intensive. We'll have to look at that. And because you're going to train in the computer. A computer is not a person, so you need a training computer to say, hey, if you look at that, your left hand going this way, that means bad, <laughs> you know, or that means n not so sure, or this is good. So you have to do that. So there's a lot of involved, but good question. Any other questions? Thank you. feedback on all the all the meetups we've done so far so we do plan on moving forward more in the next couple months um, we'll be sure to reach out via email LinkedIn with some advertising hope to get a, uh, a daytime location for the next couple and uh, thanks for coming out tonight hope you guys can join us for the next one